Good morning, good morning. It is such an exciting day as we convene to talk about issues that affect our Black businesses here in North Carolina. I am Tammy Hall and I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of the Office for Historically Underutilized Businesses in the Department of Administration. It is my pleasure to bring this forum to you with our partners, a founding partner, partner in equity, Napoleon Wallace, and the co-founder of Rezeal NC and his team. It is such an honor to co-lead with them. Well, you're in for a treat, as I said. Our morning lecture is from none other, and one of my favorite academicians, Dr. Henry McCoy. Dr. McCoy has his bio and other information that is in our platform for each of you, but please know that he is a very seasoned professional in the business community, economic development arena. I mean, he has so many accolades that we could talk about this morning, but I would rather you hear it from him firsthand. Dr. McCoy, are you ready? Yes, ma'am, I am ready. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, let's go. All right, well, good morning, everybody. It's such a wonderful um, opportunity and feed to be here. So I wanna thank Director Hall for um, uh, doing that kind introduction. I wanna um, say good morning, everybody tuning in, um, you know, bright and early at uh, 8 a.m. Uh, I know I'm getting in front of a computer this early. You know, it can be a, uh, can be a chore. So I appreciate you coming out and, and, and being a part of this. Also certainly want to thank, um, you know, the, 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 the Brazil NC, the Partners in Equity, um, Napoleon and, uh, and um, um, Talib and, and Wilson. Uh, this is a great, great um, event on the Black Business Forum, um, the Hub offices. And, and um, so um, anyway, I want to, you know, spend a little time with you today, um, hopefully kind of offer some, some, some thoughts, some things to think about uh, as we uh, move forward. So let me, um, Take this opportunity to share my screen, and I know there'd be an opportunity to, to, to I think put questions in the Q and A, and uh, I'm gonna try to, you know, not talk the the, the whole time, but let me uh, <clears throat> get this up. So, so anyway, again, um, as as the director Hall mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Henry McCoy. I, I serve as the um, lead professor in entrepreneurship at North Carolina Central University. Um, and, you know, we uh, certainly take very, very, um, um, you know, important strides to try to create an ecosystem of entrepreneurship. And, uh, and th today I'm going to talk a little bit about practical entrepreneurship. And, uh, and you know, I wanted to, to, you know, we're still in this COVID uh, moment. So I want to talk a bit about Black small business survival in pre and post pandemic North Carolina. But just to give you some context, context um, you know, I, I want to kind of dance between looking at these broader issues that we have as a as a country, um, and also what's going on in North Carolina because uh, the two go hand in hand. Um, and you know, when Napoleon at first reached out to me, uh, he, was, he, he sent me a text and asked if I'd be willing to to, to kick off the, the forum. I said, yeah, absolutely. He said he wanted me to talk about practical entrepreneurship. I said, well, that's good. I said, well, what is practical entrepreneurship? He he never really he never really uh, answered my question. So. So I'm, I've, I've taken the, the charge of um, talking today about practical entrepreneurship um, through a lens that I think uh, can be important. So uh, let me advance my slides. So, you know, I did kind of what my students do whenever uh, they have an assignment and they say, okay, well, what do you want me to do? So I actually decided, I said, well, let me just Google practical entrepreneurship and, and see what it comes up. And so what, what came up was this idea of the practical entrepreneur uh, and, and, and the actual a framework of that was, you know, rather than taking big risks, most entrepreneurs succeed by taking a far more practical approach, which just shows it's not necessary to risk everything to be a successful entrepreneur. And so I, gra I grabbed that quote and I thought about it. I've been an entrepreneur for a long time, um, you know, and I always say I got into uh, teaching because I wanted to, you know, actually teach um, young people the things I wish there was somebody there to teach me about entrepreneurship. I spent a uh, you know uh, a career in banking and and um, had my own investment firm and spent some time in government at the Department of Commerce and so you know entrepreneurship is a, a piece of all that and so I I really studied in on this idea of the practical entrepreneur because you know entrepreneurship can be you know in a lot of ways um, the most impractical thing in, in life right uh, you know this idea of 
of um, starting a business and, and, and trying to grow that business in spite of it all. And I tell my students that, uh, you know, it's, it's really, um, you know, you, you're really having to dream about something that, that is not yet into fruition. And so this idea of a practical entrepreneurship, you know, certainly intrigued me from that standpoint. But, you know, it also hit me. Uh, so, so the idea of practical entrepreneurship and, and the way it's, it's framed here is this idea of, um, you know, think about people like Bill Gates, uh, who, you know, Bill Gates didn't fully drop out of Harvard um, in order to start Microsoft. He actually took a leave of absence and he had his parents there um, behind him to support him from an economic standpoint. Um, you know, people like Michael Dell, um, Dell Computer, who started his, um, his um, company in his dorm room in, at the University of Texas in Austin with $1,000. So he was still in college uh, he was doing out of his dorm room uh, even apple computer that we know uh, started in steve jobs um you know parents garage and so the idea a lot of times is that well you know perhaps you don't have to um you know quit your job and do those kind of things to in order to to, to launch a successful business i think well you know why didn't somebody tell me that before but but we know that you know there are a lot of folks who are you know working their, their nine to five so to speak and also starting an entrepreneur uh, venture beyond that so this idea of practical entrepreneurship is something that that certainly is, um, you know, key to the idea of, of creating new businesses and moving forward. <clears throat> but it also hit me that um, perhaps, you know, what's practical depends on where you're sitting in terms of, of um, uh, your, your station in, in society. And so one thing I want to do, I want to kind of go back and we've all been for the last, you know, 15, 16 months, whatever it's been now, um, in the midst of this pandemic. And, uh, you know, and, and I talked some about that, but I wanted to kind of go back to the beginning, um, you know, February um, to April of 2020, and look at some of the data that we know um, just from those first few months uh, at the, the actual small business decline from that time point. These are national figures. Um, you know, the white businesses declined by 17%, Asians by 26%, Hispanics by 32%, African Americans, the largest of all. Um, 41%. And so I, I, I use that as some context to, to when we talk about practical entrepreneurship to say that I think practical entrepreneurship in a lot of ways depends on where you're sitting and, and what is practical to you. So I want to use that kind of as a theme as we as we talk today. So let's look at this, um, you know, from a from a standpoint of thinking about this from an academic standpoint. So, you know, here we are in North Carolina, and uh, like so many other states, we're, we're, you know, we're trying to rebound. We're moving forward. You know, we have constant debates about um, you know everything from uh, you know you know when the economy should open fully up. We, you know, there's debates right now about um, unemployment benefits and how that impacts people and their desire to work and, and all these kind of things. Uh, at the same time, entrepreneurship keeps moving, and so I I, I kind of frame this around two questions. You know, think about you know what is the impact. You know, what will um, the, the COVID nineteen mean for um, black business, you know, in terms of the impact uh, on black business, as well as the resulting response, um, what would that mean for um, the black business community? Because we know, as they say, um, you know, when the, when the white community gets um, the flu, African American community gets pneumonia. And so the question is, you know, when, when the white community gets COVID, you know, what does the black community get? Uh, and so I, I kind of posed around two questions. You know, what will the African American entrepreneurial and business landscape look like post COVID-19? As we start to, to, to move forward now, you know, what is that going to mean here in North Carolina for the business landscape? Uh, um, you know, when we know that so many black businesses have, have shut down. Um, question number two, what can be done to support African American entrepreneurs and businesses to ensure they survive and thrive post COVID-19? Um, Brazil NC did a, a and Partners in Equity did a wonderful report um, several months ago about you know, some of the, um, the, the impacts of COVID-19. And so the idea is not to really, um, you know, do that because you can go find their report, but to talk a, a little bit to a different context. And again, around what does it mean to be, uh, you know, a practical entrepreneur in this landscape and what is practical entrepreneurship? But I think also, um, if we're gonna answer the question about, you know, you know where, how, how do we move black businesses in North Carolina forward uh, post COVID-19, uh, I think we have to also understand you know, where were black businesses before that? Um, because that, that will have a, a major impact on, on where we go. So one thing I wanna do is I wanna talk uh, from a broader landscape for a moment. Um, and again, as I said, I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit from the national standpoint and, and down to, to the um, North Carolina level, just to give some context of um, kind of how we fit in this. And so, so you know, here's some, here's some, some data points for you. Um, so 
black firms are the only racial group in the United States that actually are seeing a decline in their firms with paid employees. Um, and, and the firms with paid employees are the ones that generate the most wealth. And so, of course, uh, if you're watching this as an entrepreneur, you recognize to a certain extent what I mean. Uh, there, are, there are businesses that don't have any paid employees. That's when that entrepreneur um, is, is a sole proprietorship. Um, you know, maybe just them and, and, and their truck or, or, or them working out of their home office. And that's really that really makes up the, the majority of actual businesses in the United States are businesses that, that have no employees. Uh, African Americans have a much higher percentage of that than um, than other um, ethnic groups. Um, about probably about ninety six percent of African American businesses are um, sole proprietorships, whereas um, in the white community it's eighty two percent. But those firms that have paid employees are actually the, are actually ones who generate the most wealth. Um, and they command the most revenue from the economy. And so the reason why that becomes important is that me and um, my good friend Jim Johnson from UNC Chapel Hill, um, Keenan Flagler, um, uh, wrote a report or wrote a, a journal article a few years ago, and just talked about the fact that, you know, when we looked at every racial group, all the major racial groups in the United States, um, whites, blacks, Asian Americans, American Indians, and, um, and Hispanics, blacks were the only firm that were seeing a decline in those um, firms that have paid employees. And so that's some context for you. Also, when you look at the United States, and this ultimately ends up playing itself um, similarly down at the local state level uh, and the local level is that when you look at industries across the United States, um, uh, white firms tend to command and control, um, you know, essentially 80 to 90 percent market share of, of, of pretty much every industry in the United States. Um, on average, they control, uh, you know, when you, when you bundle it all together, almost 87 percent uh, market share. Uh, in the in, in industries across the board, you know, whether that be hospitality, whether that be transportation, manufacturing, construction, those kind of things. Um, blacks comprise somewhere between zero and 3%. That means in some industries, there's like, there's no black um, participation at all, um, up to maybe 3%. And on average, we have about, um, blacks have about 1.5% um, market share. And we've seen that in, in a number of ways. And, that, and that's some of the important work that um, Director Hall and others have been doing with the hub office trying to get more and more firms involved in you know things like construction or highway and things like that but right now there's a, a huge gap um i showed you that earlier statistic from the beginning of um, last year at the beginning of the pandemic where black firms had declined by 41 percent the largest of any group in the united states um well you know looking at data and and, and, and surveys and things of that nature the black firm because particularly because they couldn't get access to payroll protection program actually expected to decline by another 50 percent um, by by november 2020 so by the um close to the winter of last year now that's 50 percent more than the 41 percent that had dropped um before so that was the expectation of somewhere around three quarters of the black businesses in the united states that existed um january 2020 would not exist january 2021 and so we're seeing this kind of you know enormous um you know tasumi coming in and, and, and impacting black businesses I talk about buy black campaigns, um, um, you know, not being enough. So we know that last year um, there were, you know, Blackout Day, which was Tuesday, July seventh, um, twenty twenty. Uh, there was also uh, from Juneteenth until July fourth of last year, there was a campaign to buy black. Um, but I mentioned that with, uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, interesting enough, you know, here we are a year later, um, you know, between Juneteenth and uh, and and um, Independence Day. And there's no buy black campaign. And so we see, you know, kind of how quickly things can change. I always say it's, it's just not enough. I mean, I'm never gonna um, push back against this idea of, of, of folks buying um, black or, or, or working um, to, to find more black entrepreneurs. And so I, I actually applaud that work. And I know there's, you know, um, you know folks who are doing um, incredible work to try to get those lists out. But it also, it's not enough to, to pick one day out of the year to decide that I want to buy black. Uh, and I also say this is kind of an aside to some some standards. I did a I did a um, an interview with the Boston Globe of, of some months ago, and, and they were talking about the, the challenge of, of black restaurants reopening in Boston because of fees and things of that nature. And I talked about just the fact that that again, um, you know, buying black one day a year or you know even for a couple of weeks is not enough. It's, it's got to become part of the this culture and the ecosystem of, of what we do. But beyond that, I mean, you think about this, there's so many folks that started this work after the George Floyd incident. And, you know, how high of a hurdle is that to say, well, you know, 
before I decided to, to buy ice cream cone from a black vendor, somebody had to die. And so I think that, you know, we, we, we have to, you know, this is very sobering in a lot of ways of where we are. Uh, and then I say that one of the last kind of, you know, broader aspects that's going on right now is that we see, for example, at the federal level in, in, in so many states, um, um, you know, this challenge, uh, even our own state, this, this challenge around, you know, I say critical race theory, but it's, it's much broader than that. I mean, it's really this idea of, um, you know, what America is and, and what it has been and how that reflects, um, you know, the, the, the business landscape. Um, I mentioned last year around this time, we actually had a, there was actually a campaign going on nationally around buying black between Juneteenth and, uh, and July 4th. Um, this year, you don't, you don't have that campaign, but you, we just got the federal holiday for Juneteenth. And so the question is, what is this broader environment that the black business, the black firm uh, must operate in at both the national level uh, and, the, and the state level? So those are just some aspects I wanted to, to bring up as we talk about this. I want to give a quick sense, and this is just kind of a quick historical overview, just to understand kind of what, you know, you know what what do we see here as a uh, as a as a black business community? How did we how do we get here? So you know you must start of course with the um, uh, the fact that 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 the black community for for almost two hundred and fifty years of time here in America you know was in slavery, and I I put that up the context in terms of this kind of these kind of stages of entrepreneurship. They were actually even black entrepreneurs. Okay, good morning again. This is Tammy Hall. Looks like we've had a little bit of technical difficulty with Dr. McCoy and his presentation. So if we could just allow a little bit of grace as he reconnects and comes back in. It's part of our experience of working virtually these days. And so if we could just be patient for a few minutes and allow him to log back in and we will start his presentation where he left off. Dr. McCoy, we are holding on for you. I am sorry, I, I, I lost my lost my screen. That's okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry that 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 uh, I'm back. Sorry that that hot spot uh, went out on me. So I hope uh, hope I'm sorry for that. But uh, uh I'm, I'm back now. Let me get this uh, from here. All right, power technology. Anyway, as a as as a uh, sorry for that, but as I mentioned, for the um you know going through this this whole idea of the stages of um, Black American entrepreneurship, first two hundred fifty years, Blacks were um, essentially the capital that that grew the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in the United States. For the next eighteen years, um, you know, really following um, the, the slavery, African Americans started their entrepreneurial journey in a, in a very um, Significant way, and uh, and and you know during Reconstruction, really served as as key um, parts of the kind of entrepreneur uh, ecosystem uh, until you know there was a you know this backlash, and and so for the next eighty years, African Americans spent um, you know really in segregation. And interested enough, as I mean, this may not be news to some folks, but during that eighty years of segregation is actually what most people think of as this idea of the, um, the, the golden era of, um, of black entrepreneurship. Um, that's actually during times whenever um, the, you know, we had the black Wall Streets to Tulsa, Oklahoma, which of course we know uh, uh, what happened there. We had Durham, North Carolina, we had places, um, you know, Wilmington before the, the 1898 uh, race massacre. We had cities all across the United States that were driven by black entrepreneurship. And so, so you know, that during that segregated period um, actually was the, in some ways, the height of, of, of black entrepreneurship. Um, the next, you know, I say quarter of a century, um, you know, starting around the 1960s, uh, the 50s and 60s became what I call civil rights entrepreneurs. 
which these are individuals that after the civil rights movements, after the civil rights movement started focus on what we think about uh, as civil rights, silver meaning that, you know, what is that, the economic pie. And so, you know, you, you had the rise of organizations like Black Enterprise and, 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 and other uh, entities such as that. And that lasted, you know, this, this idea of, okay, let's create more procurement opportunities for, for um, African-Americans and, and folks like that. That went for, I say about another 25 years um, and took us probably until, um, you know, somewhere around the, the um, you know, um, I say the, the, um, the 1990s or so. The next 20 years, I, I, I say, you know, what we call intermediate, what I call intermediary entrepreneurship, which really um, is this fact of that the white market or the white firms wanted to get the black consumers. And so they, you know, there was a rise in, in, in black uh, advertising agencies and things of that nature. And so, so, you know, you had that for about two decades. And then what ended up happening essentially is over that time period, um, you know, that takes us up to probably around, the, you know, um, the two, um, past the 2000s. What happened uh, as a function of that is that white firms started saying, well, hey, uh, instead of working with the intermediary firms, we could just create our own markets, uh, our own kind of, um, 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 you know, divisions within the business. Uh, and, you know, so here's an example, you know, Motown, as a as a dominant um, actual organization and entity for for uh, black music, versus somebody like Capitol Records who say, oh well, we're going to start an urban division. And so I say that because that that you know again, what's practical for entrepreneurship for entrepreneurship depends on the context of what's happening. And so each of these stages that we see, um, black businesses have responded in, in in a number of ways. And and where we've been, I say, for the last um, you know decade or so is what I call hustle entrepreneurs. And what that essentially means is that um, there's so many um, businesses that are being started by African Americans, but um, they're not growing and expanding in, in the way that um, you know we would like them to to have a bigger impact on the community. And so, uh, if you look at this, this the graphic on the right side of the screen, looking at the, the, the over the last you know four decades, um, or or you know from actually the five five um, different decades, but over the course of 40 years, what we see is a is a consistent pattern. So what you see in terms of the um, the, the blue bar is kind of a, the, the the change, the percentage change in growth of firms. So we see that that um, that African American firms, Black firms, nationally continue to grow. You know, every every you know um, uh, measurement period, they, they continue to grow, continue to grow. In terms of um, the orange line, the revenue change, we saw we see that that line went up pretty significantly. So over time, you know, from the 1970s through the 1990s, I mean, with the exception of the in the 80s, which of course we know. Um, you know, um, that time period was right around, the, um, you know, some of the, the uh, recessionary period um, uh, during that time period, we've seen revenue as in the, the orange bar continue to at least be positive, right? So it means it's going up at, at different levels. But if you look at the gray um, bar, the average revenue change, that's a different story. So take it out, take it out of the account like 1982, which again was a, from an um, inflationary period was, you know, you, you had stagflation, all these kind of things. Let's look at the other um, gray bars. Here's the interesting thing to note. Um, so average revenue change continued to go up um, throughout the 90s, but in the 21st century, uh, every measurement uh, has shown that average revenue change for Black businesses has gone down. So what does that mean and how, does, how do we kind of contextualize that? Well, we contextualize that meaning this, that um, we haven't, we're seeing more firms um, coming to the marketplace, so we're seeing more Black folks start businesses um, uh, we're seeing revenue change. However, that revenue, even though it's growing, is having to be split amongst a lot more businesses, which means that we, we're growing more businesses, but they're, they're ultimately becoming smaller in the black community because um, there's folks out to share uh, you know, the same revenue. And so that's a pretty startling, um, I think, um, data point to say that in 21st century, the average revenue ch um, chain for black firms has only been negative thus far. And so those, again, some of the context of what we we know to be. I wanted to kind of show something um, quickly and kind of, and think, that, again, this is across the United States, and, and but it builds some context for things about um, North Carolina. Let's let's try to make this simple, right? If you took, um, if you took um, America and you broke it down into 100s, which means that if 100, if America was broken down um, into 100 people, 100 companies, $100 um, dollars worth of cash, uh, and then what I call, um, you know, entrepreneurial strength, a hundred dollars worth of entrepreneurial strength, then this is what it would look like. Essentially, um, there would be 60 white people in America that own 
83 of the 100 businesses. Uh, and that those 60 um, white people would essentially um, control $90 of that $100 worth of, of actual capital, uh, actual capital. And then uh, of the $100 worth of wealth uh, in terms of the, the entrepreneurial strength, they would command $92 um, of that $100. In contrast, um, if you look at the black community, uh, there will be 13 black people in the United States who have between them two companies. Uh, and of that $100, they would, they would have to live off of $1 total in totality. So those 13 people are surviving off a dollar and their uh, actual entrepreneurial strength uh, would be negative, uh, negative 48. Uh, and you see these other uh, kind of contrasts. And, and again, this is before COVID, um, after COVID that, um, um, those those hundred companies, those thirteen people would essentially own only one company, uh, as opposed to to um, to, um, to to own two. And again, that's thirteen people owning one company collectively, uh, and that hundred dollars worth of um, that that one dollar cash they they share would be more like fifty cent or lower. And so that gives you some sense of just kind of where the black community was before COVID. If you look at the right side of the screen, this is just um, I, I I've created an index over time. And uh, if you look at the flat line, the flat line means equity. And equity in this sense essentially means, um, you know, your, the share of the overall population would get the exact same share of the, um, the entrepreneurial activity and the economic activity. And so if everybody, if every group, if, um, you know, the white community, the black community, each of these racial groups was getting the exact share of the entrepreneurial marketplace that they have in the overall population, then that line would be flat. That would, so flat means equity. But instead, if you look at this, uh, the way this graph shows, it's a much different landscape, right? So you have um, uh, up here at, at point one, this, this is a white community. You see the white community over-indexed, uh, way above equity. Um, this is in the United States. The black community is um, you know, significantly below equity. Uh, American Indians, um, right, slightly below, but right at equity. Um, you know, American, uh, Asian Americans are a bit above equity and then Hispanics, uh, primarily Latino, um, back below equity. And so we see these things that we, that we kind of see visually in the United States, um, but this is kind of a way to index. And so I always think about this, if you think about the, the idea of flattening the, um, the, the COVID cur curve, you know, if we're going to get to a point of equity in the United States around entrepreneurship, we have to flatten um, this entrepreneurial equity curve to get to the point that that it that, that we all are getting our equitable share, and uh, and 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 as a function of that, I talked that was a pre-pandemic uh, situation. I wanted to you know just quickly show some data. This is some data from the the early days of the PPP loan in terms of you know what you know who got what, and uh, and you know it could be a kind of a busy slide, but what this basically says is over the early stages of the, of the payroll protection program, uh, whites got. Uh, 83% of the, the, the loans, um, African-Americans got a little bit less than 2% of the loans, Hispanics got around 6.5% six, six of the loans, um, see American Indians about half a percent, Asians uh, a little over 7.5%. Um, um, this compared to their overall populations of 60%, 13%, uh, 19%, uh, and so forth, so on. So when you, the, the, the number that, that I think is important is a look at the far right of the screen in terms of percentage of equity. And what that simply means is based on, these these firms overall population in the economy what percentage of the money that, that came from the payroll protection program um, you know went in an equitable way uh, we see that the white the white businesses ended up basically um, over again you know over indexing for 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 the amount of money they got they got almost 40 percent more capital than they should have got based on equitable uh, outcomes um, you know the Asian population got about 28 percent more than um, what um, you know would have um, been based on their actual um, 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 you know row, uh, size of the population. Um, Blacks, Hispanics, and, and American Indians are all under uh, indexed, meaning that they got below equity. Um, um, you know, equity in this sense would be percentage of equity would be 100% if they got exactly what they based on their overall population. But we see that that the Black business community got the least equitable uh, out, out um, output of the payroll protection of anybody. Only only 14% of the of, of um, equity, uh, meaning that that black businesses got only 14% of the resources through the payroll protection program that they should have got, just from an equity standpoint. And and this becomes important, at least in my mind, because I often have government officials, um, particularly when I deal with local governments and others, who say, you know, Henry, I'm, I'm I'm I really care about equity. I really care about growing black businesses. 
I really care about what that means for the community. But despite you know everything that we're doing, um, we still just can't get the equity. And I often say, well, no, actually, it's not despite what you're doing. It's actually um, um, because of what you're doing. And oftentimes, we see programs, um, you know, whether it be through, through federal government or state government, local government, and how budgets and, and, and investments are made that actually exacerbate gaps um, between the Black um, businesses and, and other communities of color uh, and the white community. And, and the payroll protection program has certainly been one that has done that. Uh, in terms of in terms of that, and and there's, that could be a whole lecture in of itself. So let's talk about North Carolina again. And I, and I actually pulled data, and I, and this data you will know is the changes from 2007 to 2012. And the reason I actually um, pulled that data is because that was um, during the, the the last recession, right? Um, so this so 2008 was when the Great Recession started, uh, and it, it essentially lasted through 2012. I use that because, you know, essentially we're in a recessionary period now, even though we, we are, you know, starting to reopen the economy. Now, of course, this recession is a bit different from past recessions because this is a recession driven by uh, health gaps, although not the health gap, but the, the health crisis. And until the health crisis is totally taken care of, then you, you're going to have some aspects of a recessionary economy as the economy opens back up. Um, and now, of course, we're having challenges with people getting employers and things, employees and things of that nature. Well, if you look at this data set from um, from the last recession, and I use that because I feel like that, that we're going to see a similar pattern this time. Um, you know what we what we've had is um, you know across North Carolina there was a growth of about thirty four point five percent of um, of you know black business firms grew across North Carolina, uh, almost twenty nine thousand new firms that were added between that time period. Look at some of the, the major metropolitan areas. Um, Charlotte grew by you know black firms grew by eighty percent. Rocky Mount, you know, surprisingly, I mean, you know, you know, I guess if you go, if you spend time in Rocky Mount, I'd be in Rocky Mount a little bit later today, uh, you know, growing by 65%, Winston-Salem by you know, almost 50%, so on and so forth. I'm in Durham, um, Durham uh, only grew by about 14% um, during that time period. But I use that to say that, that, um, that, that you know, there will be an expectation that, that um, there will be a lot more black entrepreneur firms after this. I talk about that briefly in a few moments, but I say that because with every recessionary period, um, um, entrepreneurship grows because people lose their jobs and they have to be in hang out shingles. Same thing, you know, and, and black folks, as they say, typically are the last hired, first fired, uh, and then they're the last to get, you know, again, brought back into the economy, even when it opens up. So I expect that there's going to be a, a, another wave of black entrepreneurship here in North Carolina. But the question becomes, you know, what kind of um, you know entrepreneurship will we see? Will we see a growth, or will we see you know um, the continuation of of sole proprietorships and, and things of that nature? And so I just want to kind of give some context of, of what it looked, what we saw um, during the last recession, and, and I think we're going to see some similar patterns this time. Uh, I want to show this. This goes back to you know I, I showed you my my equity curve earlier. Now, when you compare North Carolina to the United States, again, this flat line, this blue line is what equity looks like. So if, if in North Carolina or the United States, the, all the races got their equitable share of the economy, um, then the line will be flat. Um, if you look at the, um, the red line, the red line is America. Uh, and so the, you see the whites, again, are over-indexed uh, above. The blacks are below. Uh, American Indians right at the line. A Asian American a little above. Uh, Hispanics are a, 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 a bit below. Now let's look at the green line, which is North Carolina. What this essentially means when you look at it is that, that whites in North Carolina uh, have, a, from an economic standpoint, uh, from through an entrepreneurial lens, has a greater uh, over-index of their own um, uh, ownership um, standpoint. Um, blacks are actually worse off in North Carolina compared to the, Af the, the national average in North Carolina from an entrepreneurial economic standpoint. Uh, American Indians and, and, and uh, Asian Americans are, look like they're about parallel to what they are nationally. And Hispanics are actually a bit better in North Carolina um, than they are nationally. So African Americans are the only group in, in North Carolina that are actually worse off um, than the national average uh, from that standpoint. Uh, uh, and again, this looks at this community economic ecosystem equity index. So what is equitable based on the 21% the of the population here in North Carolina? When I compare to our, our neighbors, let's look at you know the tri-state region, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia. Um, and, and look at it that way. Uh, and, you know, and, and in this sense, um, um, you know, North Carolina is a, is a blue line, uh, South Carolina is a green line, the jeans are the purple line. Um, 
North Carolina, again, the, the whites in North Carolina from an economic standpoint are doing better than any of the, the counterparts in North Carolina and South Carolina. So this, this essentially means it's, it's greater inequity. Uh, again, equity would be a flat line. Uh, in terms of African-Americans in North Carolina, um, we're below Virginia, but not quite as bad as South Carolina, which you know has the worst um, equ equity for African-Americans. Um, and then again, the, the other um, groups are, are pretty much uh, kind of consistent. So again, this just shows you how we compare against our neighbors. In, in this case, Virginia having a better outcome for, for, for Blacks, not as significantly better, but, but a bit better um, Blacks and, and whites to North Carolina uh, outperform, outpace in terms of their, their, uh, their share of equity than the, the, the other two states um, that, that we border. So what does that look like from a, from a numerical standpoint? So let's look at um, this um, from a numerical standpoint. If, if, and I, th I try to explain this to folks. Think about like bank accounts, right? Think about you know, we, we all have bank accounts. And so what it essentially looks like that, that from an equity standpoint or, or what's in the bank account, that, that whites in the United States uh, would have about almost $92 in their bank accounts. Blacks would be overgrown by about $48 in, in our bank account from an economic strength standpoint. American Indians would be about $2 overgrown. Um, uh, Asian Americans have about eight dollars in their account. Hispanics would be actually overgrown even more across the United States than than uh, than African Americans are. Uh, you know, we look at South Carolina, Virginia, our neighbors. Uh, let's look at North Carolina, which is you know to the to the right. And uh, and and what you have is that whites in North Carolina essentially would have one hundred and twelve dollars in their banking account. Blacks would would be in the negative about seventy six dollars. Uh, Hispanics would be in the negative about thirty two dollars. Um, uh, American Indians also would be in the negative, and Asian Americans would be a, a bit above. And so it gives you some sense of just from the economic strength and the foundation of where we are. Um, you know just how far the, the gap is. I mean these are are are, are, are huge gaps. And so again, it, it, that takes you to this question of you know what is practical based on where you where you sit. Um, and so when you take all that and throw it into a formula and, and, and mix it up, what it comes out to is, um, you know, I, I, I create this inequity composite score that says, well, how big are the average gaps in any of these particular areas? And when you take all of that and mix it together with the blacks and whites and Asians and others and say, okay, let's calculate this. Um, you have on average the gap between races from an economic standpoint is almost 116 points. Um, Virginia is at 80. Uh, when you look at our, our neighbors, South Carolina is at 126. North Carolina has the largest um, uh, average equity gap between races in, in any of, of our, um, you know, these these um, tri-state areas, which just simply means that we are more inequitable in North Carolina on average than um, you know way above Virginia, South Carolina, and and on more on. Uh, un, inequitable than the United States as a whole uh, here in the state. And so, so it just gives some context of that. And we think, you know, for Virginia, a lot of that has to do with the fact that it is, it does border um, the, the DC area. And so you have some federal procurement things that benefit black contractors and businesses in Virginia that we, that, that, that we, you know, we have challenges with some of the contracting here in North Carolina. And so, uh, as I kind of you know start to wind down with, with time, I, I want to put some context around this. Uh, I just showed you kind of the, the, the perilous state of black business in North Carolina compared to, to white businesses and the gaps and things of that nature. The fact that we in North Carolina are more inequitable on average than the United States when it comes to black businesses. So let's talk about um, this from another perspective. Uh, concentrated poverty in North Carolina is actually growing, and, and, and Blacks have the highest share of those poverty statistics. I bring it up partly because what we're seeing now is that we're, we're at a point now where we're seeing more segregation across race and class in neighborhoods across the United States than we've seen in, in decades. I mean, it's historical proportions. Uh, and we're seeing the same thing in North Carolina. Um, they, they're following those same patterns. So, if you, uh, And historically, just because you were poor didn't mean that you were living all around poor people. Uh, but now more and more we're seeing that and we're more and more seeing that black folks are, are being, you know, in segregated neighborhoods amongst other black folks in, in high poverty areas. And so that has some enormous uh, ramifications uh, because where does entrepreneurship come from? Entrepreneurship comes from the community, it comes from people. And so when you have this concentration of, of um, the black community in neighborhoods, um, then you have a challenge of, you know, where is this next generation of entrepreneurs going to come from? Um, you have, you know, food deserts, you have, you know, different kind of deserts in these communities. And so, you know, basically for the most part, um, um, uh, kind of poverty, concentrated poverty 
and race has tripled in North Carolina over you know the first um, you know 15 years or so of the of the um, 21st century, and blacks are much more likely than any other racial group to be uh, you know concentrated in poverty to, uh, to to live amongst other poor blacks. And again, um, with this being you know entrepreneurship comes from the community. Um, the question is, what is the future of entrepreneurship for, for black folks in North Carolina uh, as this as this concentrated poverty uh, continues? And so here's a few things to, to think about. Um, you know, what do we expect to see um, in North Carolina for the black business ecosystem post COVID as we come out of this? I mentioned earlier that I do expect to see an increase in North Carolina for overall black entrepreneurship. Again, black folks are displaced just like a lot of other people um, from a standpoint of the, you know, the impact of the Great Recession. And so more folks are gonna be hanging their shingle out to say, well, hey, you know, can I, can I start a business? We're also going to see an increase in racial inequity um, um, if, unless something changes. And, and I, I, I have a term I call povertyian. And povertyian essentially means that when you look at data on a broad level, what we have in the United States is an increased number of people of color. Um, those increased number of people of color are starting more and more businesses. However, as I showed you before, those businesses are becoming smaller. Their average uh, revenue is a lot less um, on average. And so that's what I call povertyian, which you're, you're actively getting up running a business, but you're getting, your, your wealth is declining. Um, we're going to see a relative and absolute decrease in black firms with paid employees. That means that, you know, that, that, that statistic I mentioned before where, you know, black paid employees is, uh, is, is, is uh, you know, those firms are going now across the United States for black firms. We're going to see that same pattern in North Carolina because of the payroll protection program just didn't help. Um, some of it might have been, you know, even the payroll protection when it was crafted to say, well, we need to focus on underutilized businesses. Some of that was too little too late. And so we're gonna see when we look at the data that, that there's less black businesses in North Carolina that have um, employees, which actually ends up having, it's, it's important because of this, um, folks tend to hire people from their own networks and people that look like them. I mean, for better or for worse, uh, women hire more women, uh, whites hire more whites, blacks hire more blacks. When these firms shrink, uh, it has an impact on who gets hired um, you know, in these jobs, who gets internships, who gets apprenticeships, you know, the wealth in the household, you know, what charities get get access to capital, all those kind of things. And so as a part of this, I, I do expect that, that you know, there, we're going to see a decrease in black wealth um, to a certain extent. Uh, and again, these are, in, in, unless something changes, um, you know, we're going to see, um, you know, black wealth and no kind of um, decline um, before we see it rise. Um, so here's a few things to think about, you know, uh, you know, what, what, you know, how, how do we re respond to this, right? What can be done? done? In the short term, I mean, you know, these black businesses that remain still need immediate cash. Um, you know, we still, those things are important um, um, going forward. Also, um, you know, in the medium term, strategic technical assistance, uh, um, COVID uh, related opportunities. So black firms need to make, we need to make sure that they're positioned well in this economy. So for example, from a restaurant standpoint, we know restaurants, a lot of these restaurants went to these grub hubs and, and things like that. So we gotta make sure our black businesses say like restaurants have a, a presence online that they have the ability to connect and to work with um, with, with that uh, as well and, and so uh, and so you know we, we want to make sure that, that there's also procurement opportunities and, and things of that nature uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and 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 as we move forth great um, hall I have a few more minutes right yeah. I think we wanted to get in just a couple of questions. So, so if you okay. want to move through, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, we also, as a state, um, you know, want to make sure that we we use in strategy. We need to increase the diversity of the Black entrepreneur pipeline to make sure that we have um, businesses in, in in various strategies and, and disciplines and, and industries going forward. We also want to need to make sure we make sure that um, we expand place and space for Black businesses. I'm going forward. Uh, we also need to increase the, the, the scale and the diversity of capital that's available to black businesses uh, and entrepreneurs. So not just loans, but also equity capital and investment and of that nature. Uh, and we also want to make sure that we're removing um, uh, businesses, uh, the, the barriers to these businesses. We want we need to change the culture of black business in North Carolina in order to, to, to move forward. Uh, and these are just some measurements that, that's important. If we're going to actually change the culture, we have to measure these things and we have to look at, make sure that we're measuring the number of black businesses that have paid employees. Um, we want to, we need to measure the, the amount of capital that's coming from both the public sector, which is measurement three, as well as the, the amount of capital invested from the private sector. 
Um, we we have to make sure that we uh, you know we 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 have a geographic dispersion of businesses so that black businesses are, are only in only in the poorest areas. They also capture dollars across the board. And then measurement six, uh, what we know from data is that the earlier um, black children are introduced to innovative environments, the better they are uh, in terms of creating businesses. And so uh, I, I actually kind of kind of go through this very quickly and, and then we can get to questions. Basically what this says is that that you know what we see now overall in the United States is a is a really a hollow, hollow out um, nature of black businesses come from you know many years of exclusion and economic discriminations that we've seen. The CARES Act really didn't help that. It was structured in a lot of ways and it exacerbated that. Uh, what we have in America is, is as well as North Carolina is that the population is getting blacker and browner. And you know, in that sense, um, uh, but it's also getting poor. Now, if a if a community is getting poor uh, over time as they grow, I mean, you know, it, it's bad for that community. But when they become the majority of the population, it's bad for everybody. And so, if we don't address that, then we're going to really be uh, in trouble. And you know, we we some people say, well, why does it matter whether you know somebody can get a, a, a item from a black business or a white business? But it does matter. If black businesses go out, uh, you know, become functionally extinct. Uh, that's going to have some serious ramifications for everybody, not just uh, the black community. And the things that we saw in, in, in the summer of unrest, I think they will only grow uh, from that. And so, you know, uh, I, I say this, this is the, the last slide I, I, I can show. I want to give some sense of, of just how big this gap is. Um, Jeff Bezos, the founder of, uh, of Amazon, as we all know, uh, his the height of his wealth was about $205 billion back in August of 2020. If you took the total receipts of, of the three million black business in the United States uh, and, and collect them together, that those receipts would be about $195 billion. That's that's actual, that's not profit, that's the total receipts. So one individual's, um, Jeff Bezos' wealth, eclipsed the revenue of three million black businesses in the United States. And that should give you some sense of just how big this gap is and, and, and why it's so important to address it. And again, um, North Carolina has some of those same patterns. So, so Practical entrepreneurship, what does that mean for me? It means equity. And, and certainly depend on where you sit and depends on what um, uh, is practical. So I, I thank you all and uh, you know, sorry for sorry for losing that, but I'm, I'm open for questions um, in whatever few minutes that we have left. Good, this is some great information. And you know, we didn't have enough time to really unpack everything. So Dr. McCoy, you've got to come back and continue to help us to understand the plight. Uh, as we see, we've got a long way to, to go to really catch parity and, and equity. So let's just address, I know there's one question in the chat around whether or not you can share your presentation for the audience. Are you okay with sharing it? Yeah, I will forward it to you all and you, you all are free to, to send it out amongst the group. Um, yeah, and, um, and, and it has my contact information on there as well so people can Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, Good uh, deal. Good deal. We'll do that. And then there's one other question we <clears throat> I'd like to address before we head into our uh, kickoff session. It says, has there been an account for the fact that many Black businesses are micro businesses in the metrics for capital investment? Yeah. So one of the things that, that's uh, in, important here is that, that you know, and I try to ask this as, as quickly as possible, is the fact that, that um, you know, because the wealth is, is there's such a huge wealth gap um, between Black Americans and, and others, you know, we often have challenges around this, this idea of friends and family, all those kind of things that help to grow the businesses from early on. Uh, and so there are certainly um, a majority of the businesses are micro businesses um, um, with, with Black firms. What we have a challenge with certainly is this idea of getting any, any kind of capital, first of all, um, but then beyond that, I mean, there's so many, when you do get capital, you have to collateralize it. You have to, you know, put my house up 125%. I mean, and, and, and so, so yeah, from, from a micro standpoint, you know, the idea is that how do we actually, you know, create a healthy ecosystem that includes both small black businesses as well as larger black businesses and, and create, you know, pipelines. And so what we know is that regardless of what the size of the businesses are, uh, from the smallest to the largest uh, across these ecosystems, um, black folks don't get their fair share of access to capital. Uh, um, and so, and, and, and I often say that in terms of the, um, the friends and family network, it often works the reverse with the black community, right? Where you have somebody who's, you know, grown up in a situation, they've gone and got that education, got, you know, your parents would say that good job, and now they're helping the family back, you know, keeping the lights on, 
keeping somebody's card note paid, helping you know, go send somebody through college. And so it's actually this kind of reverse friends and family role. And so we just got to find ways to actually better grow businesses. Uh, and I said, I, I think it's kind of like this. Um, what, what needs to happen is in order for the black community overall to, to, to increase its well-being, we need more anchor institutions that are that are founded and led by, by black entrepreneurs. Because that when we look at you know places like Tulsa and Durham and those places that did grow even when they were destroyed through highway systems, whatever, that's what made them different. They had anchor institutions that actually allowed them to grow and particularly anchor financial institutions. So thank you, Dr. McCoy. This has been a great opening to our beginning sessions of uh, our forum for today. Thank you for all of this information and we will have you back again. To our audience, thank you for joining us early this morning. If we will exit this particular session and I'll meet you over in the welcome session with the governor, Governor Roy Cooper. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Thank you.